From unspeakable acts to a chilling fate, the question echoes, what happens to baby killers in jail? In this gripping expose, we will unveil the hidden world behind prison bars and have an inside look at the haunting consequences, unexpected dangers, and controversial justice that awaits these perpetrators. Join us as we navigate the darkest corners of the justice system, where innocence meets its final reckoning. This is the untold story of baby killers in jail, a journey you won't soon forget. Liam Dean slain by fellow inmate. The case of Liam Dean is one of those cases that stand as a stark reminder of the depths of human cruelty and the devastating consequences that can result from a momentary loss of control. In a fit of rage and frustration, Dean committed an unspeakable act of violence against his two-day-old baby daughter, Luna, leaving her with fatal injuries that would tragically cut short her precious life. It was a chilling night when Luna's mother, Karen Bissett, entrusted the care of their newborn daughter to Liam Dean while she sought rest upstairs. Little did she know that this decision would unleash an unimaginable nightmare. As Luna cried inconsolably, Dean's anger mounted, eventually erupting into a horrifying attack that defied all comprehension. He repeatedly punched the tiny, defenseless infant in a fit of brutality, causing catastrophic injuries to her brain, body, and face. The aftermath of the attack revealed the true extent of Luna's suffering. Paramedics, summoned to the scene by a distraught Dean, were confronted with a sight that would haunt them forever. Luna's face bore the unmistakable signs of trauma, swollen and bruised, a haunting testament to the unspeakable violence she had endured at the hands of her own father. Tragically, Luna's injuries proved fatal, as her delicate and vulnerable body succumbed to the magnitude of the abuse inflicted upon her. Medical professionals at Leeds General Infirmary fought valiantly to save her, but Luna tragically passed away in intensive care just five days after her birth, leaving her family and the community shattered by grief and disbelief. Liam Dean's admission of guilt in the face of overwhelming evidence spared the family the agony of a trial, but it did little to assuage the pain and anguish caused by his heinous actions. His acknowledgement of punching Luna, squeezing her body and arms, and shaking her only deepened the horror of the crime, highlighting the profound betrayal of a father's duty to protect and nurture his child. In court, Luna's mother bravely confronted the devastating impact of the tragedy, recounting the indescribable anguish of seeing her precious daughter on life support. The weight of that moment, seared into her memory forever, served as a poignant testament to the depths of her loss and the enduring pain she would carry for the rest of her life. Liam Dean was handed a life sentence with a minimum term of 10 years. Just a month after being imprisoned for the murder of his two-day-old daughter, Dean was found dead. The discovery of his lifeless body revealed that he had been allegedly killed by his fellow inmate, John Westland, who had brutally attacked and killed Dean while he lay incapacitated on his bunk. The motive behind Westland's violent act stemmed from his belief that Dean was a sex offender. However, this belief was unfounded, as Dean had actually committed the horrendous crime of murdering his own newborn daughter. During the trial, Westland openly admitted to murdering Dean, stating that his motivation was rooted in his perception of Dean as a sex offender. However, Judge Rodney Jameson, QC, rebuked this claim, highlighting that Dean was not a sex offender, but had instead confessed to the murder of his daughter, and was grappling with the consequences of his actions. The judge addressed Westland's actions, acknowledging the unfortunate reality of prison life where inmates guilty of serious crimes seek someone to belittle and look down upon. In in Westland's eyes, Dean's alleged sexual offense accusation became a reason to target him. The judge condemned this hypocrisy, as Westland himself had committed serious crimes, including rape. Judge Jameson noted that it remained unclear whether Westland killed Dean for personal satisfaction, to gain favor with others, or on the orders of fellow inmates. Westland received his sentence, which included the condition that he would only be released from custody if he no longer posed a danger to the public after serving his minimum term. The court heard that Westland had previously been denied release by the parole board three times due to the risk he presented. Prison officers who found him on the top bunk of his cell made the grim discovery of Dean's lifeless body. Evidence pointed to signs of asphyxiation and strangulation, suggesting a particularly brutal attack. During the trial, Westland denied responsibility for causing the injuries, instead claiming that Dean had been a victim of bullying and had received death threats from other inmates. The tragic case of Liam Dean, who had killed his newborn daughter, took an even darker turn with the violent demise of Dean at the hands of his fellow inmate.
the Moors murders. Throughout history, the crime of killing innocent babies has been a horror that has gripped societies around the world. One pair that stands out in infamy is of Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. The Moors murders were among the most chilling and notorious cases of child abduction and murder in British history committed in the 1960s. Ian Brady was born on January 2, 1938 in Glasgow, Scotland. He displayed troubling behavior from an early age and developed a fascination with violence and sadism. Brady became infatuated with Nazi ideology and dark literature, contributing to his distorted mindset. Myra Hindley, born on July 23, 1942, in Manchester, England, was initially described as an unassuming woman. However, she became entangled in Brady's dark world, fueling her own twisted desires. Hindley was infatuated with Brady and was eager to please him, willingly participating in the abductions and murders. Between July 1963 and October 1965, Brady and Hindley kidnapped and murdered five children, Pauline Reed, age 16, John Kilbride, age 12, Keith Bennett, age 12, Leslie Ann Downey, age 10, and Edward Evans, age 17. The couple used various methods to lure their victims, often offering rides or feigning accidents to gain their trust. Once captive, the children were subjected to unimaginable torment, including sexual assault, torture, and strangulation. The bodies of some victims were buried on Saddleworth Moor, while others were discovered in their graves or dumped in shallow graves elsewhere. Ian Brady and Myra Hindley were arrested in October 1965 thanks to the courage of Hindley's brother-in-law David Smith, who witnessed Brady killing Edward Evans. The police soon uncovered evidence linking the couple to the other murders. In April 1966, the trial commenced at Chester Assizes. The trial lasted for 14 days and attracted significant attention from national and international journalists, with many booking up most of the city's hotel rooms. The courtroom was equipped with elaborate security measures, including bulletproof glass in the dock to protect Brady and Hindley. Brady and Hindley were charged with the murders of three victims, John Kilbride, Leslie Ann Downey, and Edward Evans. During the trial, Brady and Hindley both pleaded not guilty. Brady admitted to striking Edward Evans with an axe, but claimed someone else had killed him. Hindley denied any knowledge of the photographs found by the police near the grave sites of their victims. The trial included playing a tape recording in which the voices of Brady and Hindley were audible. Hindley admitted being brusque and cruel towards Leslie Ann Downey, but claimed it was because she feared someone might hear her screaming. If you ever had that tape, um, where the little kid is being um, killed on the tape. It's not that that's what it is. I'll tell you what, it really brings, it tugs at everybody's heartstrings. And I'll tell you what, it brings a tear to my eyes every time. Hindley provided explanations for her whereabouts during the murders, but maintained her innocence. On May 6, 1966, after deliberating for a little over two hours, the jury found Brady guilty of all three murders, and Hindley guilty of the murders of Downey and Evans. As the death penalty had been abolished, both were sentenced to life imprisonment. Brady received three concurrent life sentences, and Hindley received two, along with a concurrent seven-year term for harboring Brady, knowing he had murdered John Kilbride. Following his conviction, Brady was moved to HM Prison Durham, where he initially requested solitary confinement. After being diagnosed as a psychopath in November 1985, he was transferred to the high-security Ashworth Hospital in Magal, Merseyside. Brady, who never wanted to be released, spent years in prison, occasionally corresponding with individuals outside the hospital, including Lord Longford and various journalists. He expressed his discontent with conditions at Ashworth and went on a hunger strike, which resulted in him being force-fed. Brady wrote a book called The Gates of Jane in 2001, analyzing serial murder, and later made unsuccessful attempts to be returned to prison to starve himself to death. He died in May 2017 from restrictive pulmonary disease. As for Myra Hindley, she initially appealed against her conviction, but was unsuccessful. She corresponded with Brady until 1971, when their relationship ended. Hindley formed a romantic relationship with one of her prison warders, Patricia Cairns, and together they planned an escape, which was foiled. Hindley's minimum sentence was increased to 30 years by Home Secretary Leon Britton in 1985, and Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher expressed her opinion that Hindley should never be released. Hindley later confessed to greater involvement in the murders and was informed of her whole life tariff in 1994. The Moors murderer Mara Hindley has confessed tonight to her part in the death of two children who vanished more than 20 years ago.
She made several appeals against her life tariff, but was rejected each time. Hindley's potential release became a controversial topic, and efforts were made to prevent it. However, she died in November 2002 from bronchial pneumonia at the age of 60. Myra Hindley, probably the most hated woman in Britain, is dead. The Moors murderess died of a chest infection after 36 years in jail. As the years pass, the Moors murders continue to be a tragic chapter in the nation's history as a reminder of the evil that can reside within human beings. The case of Savannah Brockhill. One of the highly publicized baby killer cases that shook the world was the notorious case of Savannah Brockhill. Savannah Brockhill was a 28-year-old care worker who was convicted of murdering one-year-old Star Hobson in September 2020. Brockhill was in a relationship with Star's mother, Frankie Smith, and had been caring for Star since she was just a few weeks old. Star suffered weeks of neglect, cruelty, and injury at the hands of Brockhill, according to the prosecution. She was found to have suffered a fractured skull, rib fractures, a a broken leg and internal organ injuries. A post-mortem examination found that she had died from catastrophic abdominal injuries caused by a violent assault. Brockhill was arrested and charged with murder in November 2020. She denied the charge, but was found guilty at Bradford Crown Court in December 2021. The prosecution argued that Brockhill had subjected Starr to a campaign of abuse and that she had finally killed her in a fit of rage. The defense argued that Starr's injuries were accidental and that Brockhill had loved and cared for her. The jury rejected the defense's case and found Brockhill guilty of murder. She was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 25 years. Smith was also found guilty of causing or allowing Starr's death and was sentenced to eight years in prison. The case sparked widespread anger and led to calls for reform of the child protection system. The Channel 5 documentary Women Behind Bars Inside HMP Style featured an episode about the life of Savannah Brockhill after she was imprisoned for her horrific crime. It was shown how Brockhill was constantly accompanied by four to five guards whenever she stepped out of her cell, ensuring her protection from potential attacks by other inmates. This level of precaution was necessary at Steal, where child killers and pedophiles were kept segregated from the general prison population for their safety. The program also sheds light on how the prisoners reacted when Brockhill was being brought into the prison and how everyone was at the windows, screaming and shouting, but luckily they were locked up so no one could get to her. Similarly, Star Hobson's mother, who was also featured in the documentary, was shown placed in the lifer's wing at HMP New Hall, where other long-term inmates, including notorious serial killer Rose West are locked up. According to the documentary, she became a marked woman due to the details that emerged during the trial of her daughter's death, making her a potential target for attacks. Concerns were raised about her safety, as the lifer's wing is filled with women with little to lose and may seek retribution in exchange for small favors or goods. Online discussions surrounding Brockhill's and Starr's mother's incarceration only added to the disturbing atmosphere. In the harrowing world of prison, individuals like Savannah Brockhill and Frankie Smith, who have been convicted of baby killing, find themselves constantly marked as targets by fellow inmates. The crime of baby killing is regarded as one of the most abhorrent and heinous acts, evoking intense emotions of anger, disgust, and a thirst for revenge among prisoners. To ensure their safety, baby killers are often kept in isolation or housed separately from the general prison population. This separation is necessary to protect and prevent potential altercations or even attempts on their lives. The prison authorities recognize the extreme risk associated with housing individuals convicted of such crimes alongside other prisoners who may harbor a deep-seated desire to inflict harm in retribution. Isolation from the general population means limited contact with other inmates, restricted privileges, and constant surveillance. Baby killers often find themselves confined to single cells or kept under strict supervision, minimizing potential interactions that could lead to confrontation. The isolation experienced by baby killers in prison reflects the severe social stigmatization attached to their crimes. Even within the complex dynamics of the incarcerated community, these individuals face a unique and heightened level of danger due to the nature of their offenses. Their crimes strike at the core of society's most fundamental values, the protection and well-being of innocent children, and this engenders an atmosphere where others seek retribution. While the isolation may provide a degree of physical protection, it does little to alleviate the 
the psychological toll of being a target within the prison system. Constantly living with the knowledge that they are despised and at risk can lead to heightened anxiety, stress, and a pervasive sense of fear. It's a haunting existence, marked by the need to constantly be on guard and navigate the treacherous dynamics of the prison environment. The Angel of Death Beverly Gale Allen, born on October 4, 1968, is an English serial killer who gained notoriety for her heinous crimes committed at Grantham and Kesteven Hospital in Lincolnshire between February and April 1991. Working as a state-enrolled nurse in the children's ward, she was responsible for the murder of four infants, the attempted murder of three others, and causing grievous bodily harm to six more. Allett was raised in Grantham, Lincolnshire. During her childhood, Allett displayed concerning behavior patterns. As one of four for siblings, she used attention-seeking tactics such as donning bandages and casts without actual injuries to draw attention to herself. Alet's weight gain during adolescence further fueled her need for recognition, often resulting in aggression towards others. Seeking constant medical attention, she spent significant time in hospitals, undergoing unnecessary surgeries, such as the removal of her healthy appendix. Alet's interference with surgical scars and tendencies to self-harm led to difficulties finding medical practitioners willing to address her attention-seeking behaviors. In 1986, Allett began her nursing training at Grantham and Kesteven Hospital. She completed her qualification. Despite a track record of frequent absences and repeated failures in nursing exams, Beverly Allett managed to secure a temporary six-month position at the severely understaffed Grantham and Kesteven Hospital in Lincolnshire in 1991. Assigned to the children's ward, she began working there with only two trained nurses on the day shift and one at night. Between February and April 1991, Allett carried out a series of attacks on 13 children under her care. She deliberately induced cardiac arrest, respiratory failure, and brain damage in her victims using insulin, potassium chloride, and other drugs. Tragically, four children lost their lives due to her actions. Liam Taylor, Timothy Hardwick, Becky Phillips, and Claire Peck. Allett's reign of terror came to an end when she was arrested and charged with four counts of murder, 11 counts of attempted murder, and 11 counts of causing grievous bodily harm. She maintained her innocence throughout the proceedings and pleaded not guilty to all charges. However, on May 28, 1993, she was unanimously found guilty on each count and sentenced to 13 concurrent life imprisonment terms. The former nurse Beverly Allett begins a sentence without end tonight for murdering four children in her care and for injuring nine others. She has been serving her sentence at Rampton Secure Hospital in Nottinghamshire. The documentary Trevor McDonald and the Killer Nurse reported that Allett had confidently claimed to close friends that she would never go to prison before her trial. However, after spending only one week in prison, she refused to eat or drink and was subsequently transferred to Rampton Secure Hospital. Forensic psychologist Jeremy Coyd and criminologist Elizabeth Yardley, two leading experts who assessed Allett's mental state at the time of her arrest, concluded that she was not mentally ill and should be incarcerated rather than in a hospital. Allett reportedly admitted to all 13 of her crimes in an unsuccessful attempt to remain at Rampton Secure Hospital and evade prison permanently. Unfortunately, the families of Allett's victims were not informed of her full confession in the failed application. On December 6, 2007, Justice Stanley Burton, presiding over the High Court of Justice in London, confirmed that Allett must serve the original minimum sentence of 30 years. It was revealed that some families of Allett's victims had previously mistakenly believed that her minimum term was set at 40 years. Her minimum sentence expired in November 2021, rendering her eligible for release on parole. Allett's motives have never been fully disclosed. One theory claims that she exhibited symptoms of a factitious disorder, also known as Munchausen syndrome, by proxy. This disorder involves a pattern of abuse wherein the perpetrator fabricates or induces symptoms in someone under their care to attract attention to themselves. Beverly Allett's case has been the subject of a book titled Murder on Ward 4 by Nick Davies. The BBC also dramatized it in the Angel of Death series featuring Charlie Brooks as Allett. Her story has been depicted in episodes of true crime documentaries such as Crimes That Shook Great Britain, Deadly Women, Born to Kill, Evil Up Close, Britain's Most Evil Killers, and Nurses Who Kill. Notably, the Black Sabbath song The Hand That Rocks the Cradle is said to be inspired by Allett, according to vocalist and lyricist Tony Martin. Allett is presently held at Rampton Secure Hospital in Nottinghamshire. Her eligibility for parole arose after her minimum sentence of 30 years lapsed in November 2021. Nonetheless, the prospect of her eventual release remains uncertain. The Curious Case of Australia's Baby Killer 
All signs are pointing to a pardon for Kathleen Falbig. The woman known as Australia's worst female serial killer. Tonight, an extraordinary turn in the long-running inquiry into the convictions of Kathleen Falbig. If you think the previous cases have been crazy, get ready to go on an emotional roller coaster because this next case is considered by many to be unresolved. Kathleen Megan Folbig, a woman from Australia, found herself at the center of a highly controversial and heartbreaking case that shook the nation. Born on the 14th of June, 1967, Kathleen's early life was marred by tragedy, beginning with the violent murder of her mother when she was just 18 months old. Her father, Thomas John Taffy Britton, was responsible for the heinous act which resulted in his imprisonment for 15 years before being deported to England. Kathleen was made a ward of the state and grew up in foster care. Despite the difficult start in life, Kathleen appeared to have found stability when she married Craig Gibson Fulbig in 1987. However, their union would be marked by unimaginable tragedy. Over the course of a decade, between 1989 and 1999, four of their children would tragically pass away. Patrick Allen, Sarah Kathleen, Laura Elizabeth, and Caleb Gibson. The first loss struck in February 1989 when Caleb Gibson, only 19 days old, was found unresponsive in his crib. Initially attributed to cot death, or sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, it was a devastating blow for young parents. The second child, Patrick Allen, born in June 1990, faced a different battle. Diagnosed with epilepsy and cortical blindness, Patrick's life was cut short at only four months old. His death raised suspicions, but no clear cause was established. After Patrick's passing, the couple moved to Thornton, New South Wales, hoping for a fresh start. However, tragedy struck once again when Sarah Kathleen, their third child, died at just 10 months old in August 1993. Her death circumstances were unclear, adding to the mounting questions and concerns. Undeterred by the heartache, the couple welcomed their fourth child, Laura Elizabeth, in 1997. Tragically, Laura passed away at the age of 18 months in February 1999. Her cause of death was later attributed to myocarditis, an inflammation of the heart muscle. The sequence of deaths raised suspicion, and Kathleen's own diary entries became a crucial turning point in the case. In her personal journal, she had penned entries that implied she may have harmed her children, leading her husband to contact the authorities. In April 2001, Kathleen was arrested, accused of murdering her four children. The subsequent trial that unfolded in 2003 was a harrowing spectacle. The prosecution alleged that Kathleen smothered her children during moments of frustration, while the defense vehemently denied these claims. The case hinged on the improbability of all four children dying of natural causes, following the controversial Meadows Law, which suggested that multiple infant deaths within a family were highly suspicious. Throughout the trial, emotional ran high, and Kathleen's distress was palpable. In a dramatic moment during a replay of her police interview, she attempted to flee the courtroom. The defense countered the prosecution's claims, highlighting that there were no direct admissions to the killings in Kathleen's journal. Kathy, did you kill Caleb? No! Did you kill Patrick? No! Did you try to kill Patrick on that near miss episode? <laughs> no. And presenting alternative explanations such as cot death and medical conditions. However, the jury found Kathleen Folbig guilty of three counts of murder, one count of manslaughter, and one count of maliciously inflicting grievous bodily harm. On the 24th of October 2003, she was sentenced to 40 years in prison with a non parole period of 30 years. The case sparked national and international debate, fiercely dividing supporters and skeptics. Some argued that the evidence was circumstantial, lacking direct proof of Kathleen's guilt, while others believed the deaths were too improbable to be coincidental. In 2018, a judicial inquiry was launched to review the convictions, prompted by a petition from Fulbig's supporters. However, in 2019, the inquiry reaffirmed her guilt, and an appeal against the judicial review was rejected in 2021. Despite the ongoing controversy, new scientific and medical research emerged in 2020, suggesting that genetic mutations may have played a role in the deaths of Kathleen's children. This research presented a potential explanation for the tragic losses, indicating that two of the children carried genetic mutations predisposing them to sudden cardiac death, while the other two had lethal mutations linked to early onset epilepsy. In March 2021, over 90 Australian scientists and medical professionals signed a petition calling for Kathleen Fulbig's pardon, citing the genetic evidence. Finally, on the 5th of June 2023, Kathleen Fulbig was unconditionally pardoned by the New South Wales Governor Margaret Beasley, who exercised the royal prerogative of 
mercy. After more than two decades of incarceration, Kathleen was released from prison, her conviction yet to be formally quashed. Kathleen Fulbig's release from prison has sparked a wide range of reactions, reflecting the ongoing divisiveness surrounding the case. Many individuals feel a sense of relief that Fulbig is finally free after serving 20 years in prison, but others are angry and frustrated with Fulbig's release. There are even more people who find themselves uncertain and confused about the case, and acknowledge the complexity of the evidence and the ongoing debates surrounding the case. It is important to note that Kathleen Fulbig has consistently maintained her innocence throughout the entire legal process. She has never admitted to harming her children and has denied any wrongdoing. She's the only person in this video who may have been wrongly vilified. Kristen Berry takes her own life in prison. While some baby killers may face retribution from fellow inmates seeking revenge, some get to spend their time in solitary for the acts they did in some tragic instances. But for others, the weight of their actions becomes so overwhelming that they choose to take their own lives, succumbing to despair and remorse. Kristen Berry, a mother from Florida, was convicted of aggravated manslaughter for the death of her nine-week-old son, Chance Walsh. Barry's subsequent journey through the justice system took an unexpected turn, leaving prison guards astounded by the ultimate form of justice she delivered upon herself. After her conviction, Barry found herself facing the difficult choice of testifying against the baby's father, Joseph Walsh, as part of a plea deal. The weight of her actions and the prospect of confronting the man she once loved became too overwhelming for her to bear. In a shocking turn of events, Barry resorted to a desperate act of self-inflicted justice, suicide. In her her prison cell, Barry's inner turmoil peaked as she grappled with the devastating reality of her own flesh and blood's murder and the consequences she faced. Instead of bravely confronting the ramifications of her actions, she chose a coward's path, leaving prison guards to discover her lifeless body. Deputies say Kristen Burry committed suicide while at the Sarasota County Jail. Now she's the mother of slain baby Chance Walsh, who lived for just nine weeks before he was killed. She was the prosecution's key witness against the baby's father, Joseph. Despite their efforts to resuscitate her, Barry was pronounced dead at the Sarasota Memorial Hospital, leaving behind a haunting legacy of tragedy. This was all about the infamous baby killers and their stories. Thank you for staying with us. If you enjoy our content, our newest videos are just a click away.